Please remain standing as we read from God's Word, 18th chapter of Luke, beginning in verse 9. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Our Father, um, thank you for this word. Lord, I think I can honestly say that um, there's not a, not a Sunday comes that the weight of the responsibility to try to explain your word weighs heavily on me and I assume on everyone who has that privilege but also that awesome responsibility. Very conscious, Lord, that we will all answer one day to you for what we have said for how we have handled this perfect word. And never more so, Lord, than at this, in this passage, at this parable. If this is not the heart of the word of God, if this is not the heart of the gospel, I, I don't know where we would find it. And so I pray as we come to the very center of this today that you will, by your Spirit, illumine us, open our eyes. I pray for those who are here who do not know you as Savior. I pray that today will be the day that they come to faith in Christ. That there will be no more putting it off, that there will be no more thinking that there are other things that are more important, that the attractions of the world will seem small compared to what you have offered and what you have done. I pray that just not seeing it, somehow you will break through that barrier and that you will make perfectly clear what exactly it is that you have done for us so that we can have righteousness in you. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, and please, uh, please turn with me to the 18th of Luke, if you're not already there. <clears throat> I see Bob Tadayama is here this morning. I trust that we will still be friends after this, but um, another friend called him. You know, he's retired now. And uh, one, of the, one of the dairymen out east called Bob one day and said, uh, you know, my best milking cow has a fever. I remember when your old Bessie had one a couple years ago. What did you do? And Bob said, well, I, mixed, I, I put a mixture of turpentine and cod liver oil together and put it in her food once a day for four days. The guy says, thanks, Bob. And he left and he implemented the situation, the, the solution. But after four days, he came back to Bob and he said, Bob, I, I did what you asked, but, uh, but my cow died. Bob said, yep, so did old Bessie. Um, it's a joke. I don't think it really happened. Uh, it could have, but uh, I don't, don't think it really did. But the point is, repeating a failed process and expecting different results is a fool's errand, right? And that's what Jesus is trying to get at in this parable. There are those who are trying to repeat a failed process because they are seeing it in others. 
The general population is seeing the Pharisees go through this failed process of being good to try to get approval from God. And Jesus is saying, it will not work, but there is a solution. There is an answer. There's a wonderful answer provided by God. The parable is addressed to those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Where did they get the idea that they could self-justify? They got it from their leaders. They got it from watching the Pharisees who believed that their good efforts could put God in their debt. And so that's the way they intended to become righteous. That's the way they intended to get in to become approved by God. But the end for those who followed them would be the same as the end for the Pharisees. It would be the end of death, not the end of life. It would end that way. Matthew 23, Jesus told the Pharisees this very directly. Matthew 23, verse 15. He says, For you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. In other words, not only are you on the wrong path, but you are leading others there as well. The true way of salvation had always been there. It was in the Old Testament, just as it's in the New. Sometimes we think this is, grace is new, and that the way of salvation is new in the New Testament. It's not. It was always there. Isaiah 45, verse 22. Look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth. Not look to yourself. Not what you can do. Look to me and be saved. Old Testament people got this. Think of Jonah. who cried out from the belly of the whale and he said salvation is of the Lord. He got it. It wasn't anything he could do. Of course, being in the belly of a whale was a great illustration of that fact, Right? But he had understood before that that salvation is of the Lord. We can no more save ourselves than could Jonah get out of the belly of the whale. Charles Spurgeon, who became, who became a believer at the age of 15 when a, when a lay pastor uh, on a snowy day was the only guy there to preach a sermon to this small church where Spurgeon went because his he couldn't get to. And he said, look to me and be ye saved. And he pointed at Spurgeon eventually because he kept repeating the same thing over and over until it finally got through. And Spurgeon realized there's nothing I can do. It's only by looking to him that I can become right with God. Look to me and be saved. Spurgeon later said salvation is looking from yourself to Jesus. There are men that quite misunderstand the gospel. They think their righteousness qualifies them to come to Christ when actually sin is the only qualification to come to Jesus. So to teach that truth, Jesus gives this stunning parable that we've been looking at for a couple weeks. Two portraits in this parable, two pictures. The first is Jesus saying to them, this is who you are. The second is Jesus saying, this is who you must be. And of course, the thing that is remarkable in this parable, that it is the portrait of the do-gooder the Pharisee, the one that thought he was fine and that the people thought was fine, the one who was trying to work his way to God, who was the outside-in guy, trying to do things outwardly that would make him right with God. His whole approach was self-centered. But it was him who looked so good that Jesus stamped across that, across that picture, rejected, lost, unacceptable, do not count on your good works to make you right with God. So what's the picture of the one who's declared righteous? The tax collector, the bottom feeder, the guy in that society that would have been looked down upon as the worst of the worst. What Jesus is teaching here is that this salvation is within the reach of anyone. There is no one excluded because they are too bad. The only qualification is that we have sinned and that we repent of the sin. 
This man realized that he had nothing to offer. His approach is God-centered, not self-centered. It's the approach from the inside out. It's recognizing that he has a heart problem. And Jesus says, I tell you, this is the man who went home justified rather than the other. So across this picture, Jesus stamps accepted, approved, saved. So last week we looked at the characteristics of the guy who wasn't. Today, let's look at the characteristics of the guy who was. What does it take for grace to occupy our life the right way, inside out, the God-centered way? Number one, it takes humility before God. It takes the realization and the living it out that we cannot bridge this gap ourselves. The tax collector is standing far off, wouldn't even lift his eyes up. Everything about this bespeaks humility. He dared not even look upward. He beat his breast, which in his culture was a sign of extreme sorrow. The Pharisee is seeing himself from his perspective. This man is seeing himself from God's perspective. It makes a huge difference what perspective you look at yourself from, right? When the most righteous men in the Bible saw themselves from God's perspective, They saw themselves for the sinners that they were. Job, whom God himself calls a righteous and upright man, when he got alone with God toward the end of that book of Job, it says this is how he reacted in Job 42, verse 6. Job says, therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And you remember earlier in the book, he's defending himself. But when he gets face to face with God, he realizes who God is and who he is. And wow, what a discrepancy. And he says, "I, I need to repent. Because he saw God. David, man after God's own heart. Here's what he said in Psalm, verse, Psalm 40 in verse 12. He said, for evils have encompassed me beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me. And I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails me. Have you have been to that place? There's a broken and contrite heart that can lead us to a point of repentance before God, right? John, Ezekiel, Isaiah, we could go on and on. People in the Bible that saw God are suddenly on their face, recognizing their their bankruptcy before God, however good they may be outwardly. Humility. They saw themselves for the hopelessly lost sinners that they all are, that we all are. The Pharisee in Jesus' parable removed himself from the crowd He went toward the altar, feeling that somehow he could bridge the gap on his own. The the tax collector understood. He saw the gap for what it was. He saw the gap for the unbridgeable gap that it really was. No human effort was going to be able to bridge that gap between him and God. It wasn't possible. And so he stood far off. He understood, beloved, that when when a... when a sinner comes to God, you don't come to negotiate or bargain with God. You know, I did this, therefore you owe me that. A negotiation requires that you have something to offer. And we do not. The Bible teaches that outside of Christ, we are, we are spiritually dead. Dead in trespasses and sins. That's who we are. The only thing we have to offer is our sin. The only thing that happens is that grace is able to overcome that because God chose to do it that way. But we must come his way, not ours. It's a catastrophic realization to come to the realization, my goodness, we'll never cut it. I cannot be right with God because of my own effort. There must be a point of surrender and recognition. I cannot make it on my own. I can only throw myself in the grace and mercy of God. In the early days of the Civil War, this unknown brigadier general who had basically been cashiered out of the army for drunkenness came back on the scene because they needed generals. And he captured Fort Henry on the Tennessee River and Fort Donaldson on the Cumberland River, one right after the other in the early days of the war when the Union Union, uh, outlook was at low ebb. And General U.S. Grant became a household word, word all of a sudden. The original commander at the last of those forts at Fort Donaldson 
There's a name, man named General Pillow. He fled. <laughs> he left the scene. He left another man named General Buckner in charge. And when Buckner finally sent out, because he had no hope to conquer Grant, he said, what are the terms of surrender? And Grant said, no terms except immediate and unconditional surrender. Made him famous, right? With no recourse, Buckner surrendered. Well, the two of them got together and they were talking because they had both been together in Mexico during the Mexican War. They had served together. So they knew each other quite well. After they'd had this pleasant conversation, Buckner finally looked at Grant and he said, well, you win this time, mi casa es su casa, speaking his little bit of Spanish that he learned in Mexico, I guess. My house is your house. You win. I surrender. That's the tax collector, beloved. Coming to the recognition that he is at the end of himself, that there is nothing for him to do except to surrender himself to God. No negotiation, no bargaining, nothing except total surrender. That's the requirement. But then grace can flood your heart. Forgiveness can be yours. By the grace of God. It takes humility to do that. Come to that point, does it not? We all want to do something. Humility before God. Secondly, it takes repentance to God. Repentance to God. The Pharisee was self-justifying. The tax collector was repentant. According to verse 13, he says, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Except that the English translation here doesn't quite capture what he really said. He didn't say, God be merciful to me, a sinner. There's a definite article between the, before the word sinner. What he really said was, God be merciful to me, the sinner. It's not very good English, so they didn't translate it that way, but it's good theology. God be merciful to me, the sinner. Whereas the Pharisee was seeing himself as no sinner at all, this man sees himself as the sinner. Wow, what a difference, right? I am the sinner, beloved. When we come to God, we must recognize that we must come with repentance to the fullest extent, fullest sense of that repentance, which is very hard to do in a society and in a culture like we live in, which denies, basically likes to deny the reality of sin in the first place. A little naughtiness maybe, but sin that really offends God, come on. Yet that's what God requires. You know, if you, think, if you think of sin comparatively, outwardly, like the Pharisee was doing, which if you think of sin outwardly, if, you, if, if, if you're thinking of your goodness outwardly, then you're thinking of your sinfulness outwardly. It's, it's a comparative deal. And you can always find somebody who's worse than you, right? It's not hard. You can always find someone who's worse. And so in that condition, you will never ever be anything more than other than a sinner. Like the Pharisee, he saw himself comparatively. His sins, he compared his individual acts with the individual acts with others. And he thought, man, I'm pretty good. Even if he found a little bit of problem, it was essentially not so much that he was even a sinner. It was kind of like, I'm no sinner. This man, the tax collector, looks beyond the external individual sins to the sin beneath the sin. So that's where you have to get. He sees that his individual acts are really the reflection of a greater problem, of a heart that has been conceived in sin. He sees that it is his human nature, the old nature, the Bible calls it, the flesh beneath all of this that is the cause of the sin that is his greatest problem. That's what he's acknowledging. When this man says, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, what he is saying is, you know, I confess that my worst problem is not my individual sins, you know, of larceny and betrayal of my country because I'm a tax collector and rebellion, whatever else it is, failure to get to the temple because they won't allow me to come. That's not my worst problem. My worst problem is the, is the corrupted heart that causes all of this. 
I am the sinner, not just a sinner. If we want to fix the righteousness problem that we have with God, if we want to be justified with God, if we want to be approved before God, beloved, we have to, that's the position we have to come to. The, you know, the, the moment has to come when we basically are saying, Lord, I've had times in my life when I have been pretty bad. I made wrong choices, some of them willfully, some of them not so much, but I, I got myself in trouble because I was doing wrong things, and I, and I acknowledge that there was some bad in my life, but there's been periods of my life when I was pretty good. I went along pretty well. I was, you know, pretty faithful to the Ten Commandments for a while at one time. But I see now, I see now that beneath even my good acts and my bad acts was basically the same purpose. I always wanted to be my own savior. I was trying to self-justify. I thought I could put you in my debt. I might have had right, mo right actions, but I had the wrong motives. And it has not worked. I'm not changed. I don't sense that I'm approved by God. So today I want to repent the sin beneath, not just my sin, but the sin beneath my goodness. I want to repent of the sin nature that is part of me. I want you to replace my heart of stone with the heart of flesh, like you promised in your word. I humble myself before you. I repent not only my sinful deeds, but my sinful condition. I repent it. The day we swallow our pride, beloved, and say my record is bad, but my nature is worse. The day we acknowledge my guilt is there because it's real. That's the day there's hope. That's what opens the floodgates to the cleansing, forgiving power of Jesus Christ to come into our lives. And nothing short of that can do that. I think it was the theologian Ed Clowney who said one time, he said, uh, he said, if you have a negative self-image, just being realistic. Because outside of Christ, that's who we are. David said, in iniquity I was brought forth. In sin did my mother conceive me. True repentance, beloved, has to come to the point of realizing it's not just the individual acts of sin, but the indwelling sin that caused them that is the problem. We are the Sinner, all of us. Ray Pritchard, a pastor, he tells the story about uh, the day he was sitting watching a ball game. If you want to know what pastors do in their spare time, that's, we watch ball games. <laughs> he was watching a ball game, and uh, all of a sudden he heard a loud crash. That wasn't good news. <laughs> And immediately, even before he could get out of his chair, here came his youngest son running in, and he said, Dad, Dad, Mark broke the window in the screen, in the screen door. And immediately, of course, Mark was on his heels and said, Dad, Dad, yeah, it, but, but I just broke a little piece in the corner. It's, just, it's not bad. It's just a little bit I broke, just, just a little bit in the corner. So he got up, and he went and looked. And sure enough, just a little, there was just a little hole in the corner of the window. Otherwise, it was okay. They'd gotten a hold of his golf club somehow, practicing their swings, and one of them got away from him, and it made this little hole in the corner of the window. So Ray had to explain to Mark that if you break a little corner of the window, the whole thing has to be replaced. You, know, you, you can't just break a little bit of a window, see? You can't just be a little bit of a sinner, see? James tells us that if we didn't get it any other way. Remember what he says in James, the second chapter? He says, for whoever keeps the whole law, everything, you're perfect outwardly and you're perfect inwardly. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. What's he saying? He's saying you can't just break part of a window. You can't just be partially pregnant. You can't just be a moderate sinner. 
we are all the sinner. Until we've confessed that, until we've acknowledged that, we haven't given Jesus the right to go into our heart and to change us from the inside out. That's what repentance is. Brendan Manning says it this way. He says, paradoxically, listen carefully to this. He says, paradoxically, paradoxically, what intrudes between God and human beings? What creates this gap? What intrudes between God and human beings is our fastidious morality and pseudo-piety. It is not the prostitutes and tax collectors who find it difficult to repent. It is the devout who feel they have no need to repent. So I ask you if you confess the sin beneath the sin. I mean, have you truly been on your face before God and repented? Not just the individual acts of rebellion and sin against him. There's plenty of those. But the fact that you are from your inside out a sinner so that he can go to work and regenerate you. That's why the Bible talks about rebirth and regeneration. Apart from that, you cannot be approved by God. It must be true and honest, heartfelt repentance to God. Finally, humility Repentance, item C, faith in God. The third thing, faith in God. There must be faith in God. We must trust God to do this. His faith is entirely in God, not in himself. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Not me, do the best you can, but God, be merciful to me. His faith is in God. And once again, There's beauty in the words of Jesus here that go beneath the surface. And once again, you can't see it in the English translation. I hate to say that. 95 plus percent of your English Bible, you get everything you need to have to get it. Once in a while, the original language adds a little bit. And I hate to keep saying that, but in this passage, in this phrase, it just happens there's a couple places where you really need what it says. So let me tell you what it says. The depth of meaning here. The word merciful that Jesus uses, God be merciful to me a sinner. It's not the normal word for mercy that's used in the New Testament. The normal Greek word for mercy that's used in the New Testament is eleos. And it means to feel for someone. It means to kind of empathize with them. For example, we're going to see it later in Luke 18. If if you're in Luke 18, just look over at verse 38. There's a blind man. He calls out to Jesus and he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. It means feel for me, have sympathy for me, have mercy on me, do something for me if you can. But the word the tax collector uses goes much deeper. It's the Greek word hilaskamai. From a root word hilaskas, hilaskamai, it means to propitiate, to propitiate or to atone for. He realizes he needs more than just mercy, he needs more than just God feeling bad for him. He realizes that his sins must be paid for. It's not enough to have remorse. It's not enough to have you feel bad on this side and have God feel bad on that side. The sins still have to be paid for. Mercy, in order to be enacted, requires payment. And so the translation here would be, God be propitiated to me, the sinner. Propitiation, it's a big word. What does it mean? Just make it small. It simply means to provide satisfaction or even more simple, to pay the penalty for. Propitiate me. Pay the penalty for me. That's what he's asking. God, make atonement for me. The sinner, I can't do it on my own. I recognize that my good cannot outweigh my bad. There's nothing I can offer to you that would make me approved to you, so I need you to propitiate me. I need you to atone for me. I need you to pay my price. Is that a bold question or or a request? But that's what he's doing. Because why? Because he's putting his faith in God. And there's no other place to go. As you can imagine, the picture for this comes from the Old Testament, right? 
It comes from the Old Testament. It's directly from the Old Testament temple. At the center of the temple, you'll require this thing called the Holy of Holies, the holiest place. It was the place that was entered only once a year by the high priest to offer sacrifices for the people. And in that Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant, the box covered by gold. And over the Ark of the Covenant was, when the temple was cleansed and when the temple was suitable to God, was the presence of God illustrated with a cloud. A cloud just hung over that physical thing that you could actually see if you're the high priest and you got to go in there. The presence of God was there. When Solomon built the temple, remember, the presence of God came into that place, into that holy of holies. It represented God and God is there. But inside the box was what? The Ten Commandments. The stones that God had with his own hand written the Ten Commandments on. And the picture is, you can't come to God except you have somehow been approved through those Ten Commandments, those Ten Commandments that describe the character of God. You've got to somehow pass the scrutiny of those before you can become acceptable to God. Who can do that? No one can. No one can. No one can be that good. But thankfully, the picture didn't end there, right? What's, what's at the top of the box? It's covered. What covers the Ten Commandments? What covers the thing that causes the sin? The mercy seat. The gold-covered mercy seat is there. You say, wow, that's great. There's a mercy seat, so everything's okay. No, no, everything's not okay. Right? Because the mercy seat of, of, in and of itself wasn't any good unless what? Unless the priest came and sprinkled what? Blood on the mercy seat. The mercy seat just provided the possibility for atonement. It was the blood sacrifice that made it effective. And so now, based on the blood sacrifice given by the mercy seat, because man could not do this on his own, suddenly the Ten Commandments which condemn him have been covered. And man can be made right with God. That's the picture. Now, the mercy seat, guess what the word is in Hebrew? The word is kafar, covering. In Hebrew, uh, in the Greek, it's hilaskamas, the same word that the tax collector uses. Another way to translate this would be to say this man is saying, please God, be my mercy seat. Be the one who is the mediator between your holy presence and the Ten Commandments that describe the character of God that condemn me. Would you please be my mercy seat, me, the sinner. I need you to be my mercy seat. What a picture, right? Did God answer the prayer? Boy, did he. 1 John 4.10 In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the, guess what? Propitiation, the hiloskamas, the mercy seat, who is the mercy seat? Jesus. He sent his son to be the mercy seat that this tax collector was pleading for, that he recognized he had to have. He sent his own son to be the propitiation for our sins. So what has happened? God has looked at the sinner, the one who's acknowledging himself as the sinner, and he said, I will be your mercy seat, so I will make my son who is perfect in every way to be the sinner in your place. That's what the cross is all about. Never mistake it. Is it about a great example? Yes. But is it more than that? Oh, so much more than that. It's about Jesus becoming the sinner so that you can become the righteousness of God in him. That's what this parable is showing us as the way of salvation. You want to know what propitiation is? Second 
Corinthians 5, 21. Most of you know it's one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So here's the tax collector, the sinner as he's declared himself. Here's the Lord Jesus Christ who is perfect in every way. But when he went to the cross, he took upon himself the sin of the world. So when the tax collector says, I'm the sinner, God says, fine. I now look at Jesus as being the sinner. I look at you as being the righteousness of God. Anything fair about that? No. It's grace. Did you notice when we sang today that what does God do now? He looks on him and pardons me. Propitiation. If you don't love the word before, I hope you love it now. It's the process by which Jesus became sin for you so that you could become the righteousness of God in him. And listen, it only gets better. And first, that was 1 John 4. In 1 John 2, John says this, 1 John 2, verse 2, it says, He is the propitiation, the mercy seat, the halaskamas, not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. In other words, Jesus Christ, when he came to the cross, has taken the guilt and he's made the payment and paid the price for anyone who will come to him by faith and accept the gift. Anyone. Anyone who will humble themselves before God, who will repent to God and who will place their faith in God can be saved. Don't you love grace? Don't you love propitiation? It's the only way, beloved. It's the only possibility. This is the message of the whole Bible kind of put together in one little phrase that that tax-collecting sinner had at his disposal. It's not what we can do. It's what he's already done. Saves us. The words of one of our great new hymns that we sang earlier, because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free for God, the just, is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. Don't get any better than that. I have no message that would ever be better than that. The only question is, have you accepted the gift? Have you accepted the propitiation? Are you still busy self-justifying? Are you still busy adding up all the great things you've done? And there may be a ton of them. I don't know. I, all I know is they will never add up to nearly enough. But Jesus' righteousness did. And it can be yours as a gift. May 21st, 1946, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, there was a young scientist he was still working. They had figured out how to build an atomic bomb by that time, but they were still doing experiments to try and determine exactly how much U-235 uranium, certain type of uranium it took, to come together to create the chain reaction, the critical mass, they called it, that was necessary in order to ignite that atomic bomb. And so as he had done many times before, this young man who was working, conducting this experiment, he took the two spheres of U-235 and he pushed them toward each other. His intent was to do what again he had done before as he recorded his findings that as soon as it was about to reach critical mass, he had a little screwdriver and all he had to do was push the two hemispheres of uranium apart and everything would be good. The only problem was on that day, just as the material was about to become critical, the screwdriver slipped. And so, Louis Sloten, that was his name, he did, he, he reacted very quickly. He took his own hands and he pulled the hemispheres apart because immediately, immediately the room was filled with this bluish haze and everybody knew the radiation had been let loose and he, and he pushed the spheres apart. And by his quick action, he saved the lives of seven other people who were in the room with him, but he knew he had certainly taken a fatal dose. In fact, as they, were, as they were waiting for the ambulance to come that was going to take him to the hospital, he said to one of his companions, he says, you guys, I think you guys are going to be okay. He said, but I'm a dead man. And nine days later, he was dead of radiation poisoning. But by his actions, he stopped the chain reaction that would have killed everybody else. And beloved, this is what Jesus did on the cross. He paid the price for our sins. He propitiated us. 
He stopped the chain reaction of sin that would have taken every one of us to hell, and rightfully so. He became the sinner in the place of that tax collector and in the place of every other person who will ever place their faith and trust in him. So I have to ask you this morning, who represents you? Is it the Pharisee or is it the tax collector? Are you still the sinner or has Jesus been the sinner in your place because you've accepted his gift? Somewhere in studying for this, I came across another little poem that I thought really said it well. It said, two men went up to pray, or rather say, one went to brag, the other to pray. One stands up close and treads on high, where the other dare not send his eye. One nearer to the altar trod, the other to the altar's God. What was the difference? Repentance. Pray. Our Father, we live in a society that tells us we don't need this. We don't need repentance. We don't need all this guilt put on us. We don't need all this false feeling bad. And yet, from the inside of our being out, we know we are not acceptable. We know it. But we have been taught to deny it. We have been taught to suppress it. We have been taught it doesn't matter that much. And so repentance is foreign to us. The whole idea of turning away from sin, the two-fold part of repentance, really, to acknowledge the sin but also to turn away from it. There's no repentance if it's just saying, yeah, okay, so I am, but no turning. Repentance is both. Lord, I pray right now, in the quietness of the moment, there are those here who do not know you. Would you please remove the blinders right now? Help them to turn in faith to you. I know it takes humility to acknowledge oneself to be a sinner. It takes faith to place trust in you. And Lord, it takes removing all the pride to admit, to confess, to repent who I really am outside of Christ. But would you please help people to do that so that they can leave here cleansed. They can do just what this parable said. They can go home justified, declared righteous by God. Help that to happen for the sake of your Lord Jesus Christ who gave his life to let it happen. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.